I'd like to welcome all of you to this overwhelming turnout. Uh, and in a way, I hope there are a lot of people listening in because this is a, uh, today's discussion topic is an important one. Important from, uh, from two standpoints. If you look at the uh, value diminishing networks that affect agricultural production, co-ops can and should play a very important role uh, in the countries where we work, as, just as they do here and in, in some countries where they're extremely, some emerging economies where they're very successful. And understanding what leads uh, farmers to either patronize or not patronize a cooperative, which in turn is related directly to their success or failure, is very important. Overriding that or overarching that is the question of relating research to the work we do. Uh, I am uh, with the E3 Bureau, a local sustainability office, and for the last uh, several years have been responsible for the co-op development program. We've tried to focus that program on research because uh, with co-ops, and I would say this extends to much else that we do, Understanding the obstacles, understanding the challenges uh, to organizational uh, groups uh, working together, mutual self-benefit of uh, various kinds, can and should be an incredibly important part of our work. But the, uh, there's a, there are a lot of unanswered questions. And this type of research, the research of the, that uh, will be discussed today, which uh, the Ag Council uh, supports and which the Bureau for Food Security funds is extremely important. I would like to express my thanks to the Bureau of Food Security for, uh, for hosting this. And uh, I do hope that the, the proceedings are shared widely beyond this particular group. Let me now give you a uh, unpaid commercial announcement for AgriLinks, which is the uh, platform that the Bureau for Food Security uh, uses to uh, encourage the development of ideas and their sharing. Uh, the research into the work we do and its uh, dissemination. This is incredibly important. Uh, and in a way, it's, uh, I have to express a little disappointment that there's such a small group here because these sub we're too busy as an agency sometimes to, uh, uh, to learn. There's nothing more important to the value of our work than to the learning that's done in forums like this. If you uh, want to use AgriLinks, uh, you can get information on it by uh, emailing agrilinks at agrilinks.org. That's folks right now. I would uh, now like to introduce our three participants, one of whom is uh, connected to us virtually from England. The first is uh, uh, Lorenzo. Sabudi, who is with the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, postdoctoral fellow, and somebody who has uh, done quite a bit of work with USAID and with other donors that are rel that relevant to the research that will be discussed today. Greg uh, Grote is an old colleague of mine. Uh, he, he works with Land of Lakes one of the participants in our cooperative development program. And uh, I think Greg has brought an unusual combination of practical experience, skill, ability to work in the developing world, and a commitment to using research as a tool to do what Land of Lakes does better. Rocco Machiavello 
is uh, a professor of economics at the University of Warwick. Uh, he works at the intersection of development economics, international trade, organizational economics, which is particularly relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, and he looks at institutional constraints and the, the challenges uh, to in, that face industrial development. Uh, he's a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics. At this point, uh, I'd again stress that I think this is an, a very important subject, both because of the content and because it illustrates the ways in which uh, research can inform practice. Uh, at, the, at the end, I will facilitate a question and answer period. At this point, Greg, take over. Thank you, Tom, for that very nice warm introduction and, and background here. Um, before I get started, I wanted to uh, take a moment and give some special acknowledgement. In addition to the, the great collaboration that we've had with Lorenzo and Rocco, I wanted to recognize the contributions of a few others who have done extensive work with us and have helped inform a lot of the, uh, the things I'll be presenting today. So in particular, professors Mike Cook and David O'Brien from the University of Missouri. Uh, the Tango International team, including Lloyd Donwart and Mark Langworthy, and also Alfred Aurora from the Kenya Cooperative Bank. So with, uh, with their support and work, um, we've been able to learn a lot about cooperatives, and in particular, this topic of, uh, around loyalty and governance and producer organizations. As Tom mentioned, uh, Land O'Lakes is one of uh, the implementers of USAID-funded cooperative development program. I've been managing Land O'Lakes uh, program over the last three and a half years, and much of what I'll be presenting today is based on our research and insights gathered from working with vertically integrated dairy cooperatives in the, in the Kenya dairy industry. Um, as I was reflecting on some of the things that I've learned over the past three and a half years working with dairy cooperatives and some of the things that I'm hoping we can take away from today's Ag Sector Council, I was thinking that, um, you know, of, of the importance of understanding loyalty and what that means for improving cooperative performance. So I, I hope after today we'll have an increased appreciation for some of the complexity around loyalty um, and certainly some of the key drivers from loyalty, especially things that we've gathered from some of the research we've done. I hope that we'll also have a better appreciation for using data, insights, research to improve management decision making, to improve the ways that managers are able to run cooperatives. And finally, I, I hope there's appreciation with a, a, a combination of, of folks here to recognize the importance of collaboration, in particular collaboration with cooperatives, collaboration with academics, and with development implementing organizations. So why are we talking about loyalty in the first place? Why does loyalty matter? I think that's a fundamental question. Well, well loyalty to me, I believe that loyalty is one of the main drivers of of cooperative performance, uh, cooperative financial performance, viability, and sustainability. Cooperatives around the world have developed many different mechanisms to deal with the issue of loyalty. Certainly, we see cooperatives and marketing cooperatives and multi-purpose cooperatives in the United States and other places uh, enter into exclusive contracts with their suppliers and farmers in order to enforce uh, loyalty. In other cases, cooperatives may use uh, more a form of a graduate sanction or members are penalized over time um, when they do not obey by the rules or the bylaws of the, co uh, of the cooperative. In other cases, we've seen more flexible arrangements. So experience from the, uh, the dairy industry in India, for example, where uh, cooperatives have set up flexible structures by creating a ratio of uh, required delivery based on differences between the flush season when milk is abundant and the dry season when milk is less abundant, so that farmers can can, uh, are required to give a certain amount, but there's some flexibility built in with that arrangement. But the question arises, what if those types of structures aren't suitable? Either there's not interest from the members and management in the cooperatives to do this, there's not political will, there's other circumstances that are not allowing uh, cooperatives to use more formal means, such as contracts. And so uh, what can we learn about that? Well, this is clearly the case that we've seen in many developing countries of Burton. And the Kenya dairy industry is a good example. 
we've seen uh, membership grow in a number of these dairy cooperatives. We've seen that members value being part of the cooperative, even and members can be loyal to these cooperatives, even though there's not some of these formal mechanisms to do so. So that's what I'd like to discuss a little bit more today, um, and particularly focus on several key drivers for cooperative membership. So um, one of these is good services. And in particular, I'm talking about services that are good value for their money. Um, that's one thing we'll talk about. The second, probably one of the most intuitive to me, is access to markets. I mean, this seems like, you know, this seems like a fundamental reason for the existence of cooperatives and why someone would belong to a cooperative. But I don't want to, to miss that one. A third one, which is a little bit more uh, complex in my mind, is these emotional benefits, let's call them, or associations that individuals have with cooperatives. And so I'll explore that a little bit further with some of the qualitative research we've done there. And then the final is trust in the cooperative, and in particular, trust in the cooperative leadership. So let's dive in. Um, so the first thing we did is we wanted to understand why are farmers members of these cooperatives. So we asked over 1,000 farmers um, in Kenya. We focused on two different what I'll refer to from here on out as, as clusters. Um, basically, cooperatives uh, operate under one structure in different geographies. We worked in two different regions um, in the country. And I'll refer to them as cluster A and, and cluster B. Um, but we asked these, these dairy farmers why uh, they were members or what the value of the membership was. And the first thing, the first thing that came out was that they valued uh, payment delivery, both the timeliness and the convenience of payment. These were the top factors. Services, which I'll lump in several things, including uh, different types of extension, training, access to inputs on credit, exchange visits. These types of things that the cooperative are doing that are service oriented for the members was a close second. And interestingly, price was dead last. So this was very interesting to me because I think there's often a misconception that farmers are only price sensitive. And if we just move the price a little bit, it's going to change the way that farmers behave or whether they're loyal or not to a cooperative. And I know Lorenzo and Rocco will talk in more detail about some of the, their research and, and findings on this. But I think that's important for us to keep in mind, especially now that we look at non-members. So in the same geographies, farmers, some of them were neighbors with each other, were not members. And so we asked them the same questions. We saw quite a different picture, as you can see. Guess what ranked uh, highest? The reason why they're not members is because of low prices. So the non-members clearly viewed the cooperative in a very different way. They were looking at alternative markets, alternative buyers, and they really put a premium, as you can see, on price. This was by far above the most important thing in their mind um, compared to, to other, other important factors like payments and, and services also referenced here. So we wanted to understand a little bit more detail. OK, so what? So farmers who are members value services. We get that. Okay. But what is that doing for them? What is the benefit that's creating? So we took a look at uh, the relationship between services used for farmers and the value that that was creating. And we did this in both clusters. And we actually saw a pretty similar story emerge for both. So this is an example from cluster A. We, we took data in 2011. And then we uh, uh, surveyed the farmers later in 2015. And we saw, interestingly, for those who are using few services, zero or one, they actually had decrease in, in productivity. But those who um, used more services had significant increases. And we saw a very similar story come out in, in this cluster B. And, and we're looking at the value of milk production per cow um, based on the services used. Now, I, I want to be careful here not to imply causality, because cl clearly uh, farmers who are using more services may be gaining productivity. But likewise, farmers who um, were maybe some of the less dedicated or less sophisticated farmers may also be using less services. And so there could be some other, other reasons behind that. But the point I'm trying to make here is that farmers who are members valued services, and farmers who are using more services were, were making significant gains in productivity based on the cooperatives that we were. So to me, that's value. That's creation of value uh, for the cooperative and, and a reason why one would be loyal. The second, um, the second driver of loyalty that we want to talk about is access to markets. So, here we also did a, a little bit of surveying of the cooperatives to take a look at um, what, they, uh, what their different channels were uh, in markets. And we're operating in, in the cooperatives here are operating in markets where there's a decent amount of competition. And so there were actually a number of other, uh, other means by which uh, members could deliver milk. It wasn't just the cooperative. You had 
uh, traders. Um, and you also had private dairy companies who were not cooperatives. And you had direct delivery to uh, organizations, uh, companies like a hotel. We kind of lumped hotel and other businesses just into one category for the purpose of this graph. Um, so not surprisingly, the, the co-op members are delivering primarily to the co-op. I actually was surprised how high loyalty was here. 80% of deliveries were going, um, going to the co-op. Now I think there's some nuance there, and Rocco and Lorenzo will get into that in a little more detail. There's some seasonality fluctuations. There's actually some significant differences between loyalty when it comes to morning deliveries of milk versus afternoon deliveries of milk. And, and really important to understand some of those nuances, and that will come out a little bit later in these presentations. Um, but the point is there's different ways to access the market. The cooperative members are using the cooperative to do that primarily um, throughout the, the course of, of the year. We also wanted to supplement this with a little bit of qualitative information to, to just get at more of like what's really, what's really driving um, uh, members in, in, in the cooperative. And so we did a number of focus groups uh, and talked to dozens and dozens of farmers. And I just captured one, um, one comment here. I think it was representative of sentiments that we heard throughout these focus groups from a number of different farmers. This one was in particular was a woman uh, who's a dairy farmer in central Kenya. And her quote was, me, I can never sell my milk to another buyer other than the dairy. I do not have the strength to chase the brokers to pay. I also would like to see our dairy remain with us so that we can have a stable milk market. And to me, it's those last three words that really struck me, stable milk market. So it's not just about a milk market for today. It's clearly there's several different choices of market today, but a stable milk market. So to this person, the cooperative's benefit was they were offering that stability over time to have market uh, to have access to the market. And we categorized and looked at a number of different things, which I present in bullet points here, as far as the general themes that were coming out of these focus uh, focus groups. So I already talked a little bit about some of these services, the knowledge, trainings that the cooperative is giving, highly important, uh, the benefits of increasing productivity through the access to inputs. Um, the third thing was the reliable milk market and reliable payments. So this definitely came out very strongly when we looked at some of the focus group and qualitative, uh, qualitative information. The third driver I'd like to talk a little bit more is about the emotional benefits. Um, and, and this is really about the association one has with, with a cooperative. And this might not be uh, very strange. I mean, in, in, in other worlds, I mean, certainly in, with branded products, companies will talk about the transference of that brand from generation to generation. You, know, you, you bought this product because your dad or your mom did. Right? And so it's may not surprising that cooperative members may also have very similar types of associations with their experiences with the cooperatives. And so this has been studied in the literature, but we wanted to just understand this a little bit more uh, in the context of the work we were doing with dairy cooperatives. So we first just wanted to assess what does membership actually look like? And, Interestingly, the members of these dairy cooperatives have been members for a long time. So you can see the average here is you know, 16, 17 years of tenure with the cooperative. So we're talking about individuals who have been with the cooperative quite a long time on average. And this didn't vary depending on the services that they were using. So some, some members have been there 16 years, were using just a one, one service, and others were using multiple services there for many years. Um, we took another angle at this through the focus groups. and asked uh, members about their sentiment um, as being part of the cooperative. And so I've just chosen a few of these to highlight just as examples, but we saw these throughout. And to me, I'm picking up on some key words throughout here. So in one case, an individual stated, for over 30 years, I've sold milk to dairy, right? So that tells me long time, really long standing relationship uh, and, and work with the cooperative. The other, the other used the word exciting experience. Wow, exciting experience. So they described the relationship with the cooperative is an exciting experience. Well, that, to me, is an emotional connection that an individual has with, with the cooperative. Um, the other one actually talks about an experience they had that wasn't so great, where they actually left the cooperative um, because of some management issues and came back. Yet, despite that, um, they, they talk about how they want to uh, be members forever and will not cease to be. So clearly there's, you know, I'm looking at the choice of words and there's things that are coming out here that show that strong association and connection to the cooperative. We think that that is one of several things that is really driving loyalty in, in these situations. The final thing is around trust and cooperative leadership. So this is another 
uh, area that's been studied quite a bit. There's been a lot of research on the role of social capital and trust in cooperative formation and uh, collective action. But we wanted to just understand this a little bit better in the context of how is trust playing out in these dairy cooperatives that we're working with. So once again, we had to look at two different clusters, two different regions, um, and collect some data on this. And uh, it's striking right, to see the difference between members and trust they have in these institutions versus non-member trust. So across the board, the trust levels remain relatively the same if you're talking about things like church, family, government. Not a big difference between member trust and non-member trust. I put a star next to ones that were statistically significant. Huge difference, right, in the perception that non-members have uh, and trust in the cooperative and, and members have. Uh, and, then, and then you can compare that to traders who both, you know, in particular members have significantly lower trust of, but the non-members have, have a high trust in. And that correlates well with our data that we saw on, on where they're actually delivering their milk, right? Um, so we, we sliced this a little bit different way and said, well, let's compare the um, levels of trust that, that farmers and the cooperatives have across several different buyers or ways that they could market their milk. And what's interesting here, in both clusters, the traders, uh, um, well, the, sorry, the trader in, in, in Milkshed B was actually higher than the cooperative, and the private dairy in Milkshed A was higher than the cooperative. So this was actually saying that members trusted an alternative means better than the cooperative in each case. Um, but they also, at least in, in Milkshed A, trusted the cooperative, uh, cooperative more, more than they did in Milkshed B. So what I haven't showed here is a, is a layer on performance of these cooperatives. And so, as you might expect, one of these cooperatives was actually performing quite, quite better than the other, and that was, um, that was in Milkshed A. So the cooperative that had the high levels of trust with the management and with, um, with the cooperative had significantly higher um, levels of performance when we looked at their financial performance um, and, and other metrics. So this just, this just highlights again you know, the difference between the uh, satisfaction levels, um, maybe another angle to trust between high performing and low performing cooperatives that we saw as we, as we applied the financial metrics next to these. And you can see across the board, those that were high performing had a much stronger uh, appreciation for the and satisfaction with the cooperative. So before I turn it over to Rocco, um, I know a lot of you are probably asking, well, so what? Like, what does all of this really mean for me? So I'm maybe an implementer. I may be doing something uh, directly working with cooperatives. What can I take away from this? Well, I think a few things. So, and, and, and this is really things that we've been working on in partnership with the cooperatives that we work with, not only in Kenya, but in other, other countries around the world. Is One is, well, I don't expect uh, cooperatives in many developing countries have the resources to fund this type of research or data collection. The importance of using data to drive management decisions is something we're really, really emphasizing. You can do that in a fairly simplistic way. So that was one, uh, one key thing that we're, we're focused on. The second is we talked about services and the importance of services to drive loyalty. And so services can be differentiated. We also have to understand from the farmer how are services adding value. So we're spending a lot of time also focusing on how can services be a differentiator combined with some of these other factors that influence loyalty to really uh, improve the performance of the cooperative? Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Rocco, who's uh, calling in from the UK, and uh, he will share some of his work from Kenya and, and other countries. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Greg, and um, uh, welcome, everyone. Um, before I start, let me just say that um, I'm, you know, my main background is on sort of studying organizations at large, not just uh, uh, farmers' organization and corporate. So in that sense, I'm really very much looking forward to uh, this event uh, to deepen my learning and my understanding of this particular type of organizations. At the same time, I think that sort of coming from a broader sort of perspective, maybe uh, sort of uh, might help in bringing, you know, slightly different, uh, uh, slightly different focus. And before I start, I also would like to um, say that, you know, there are many um, different people that I like to thank for the research that, uh, that um, you know, that sort of underlined the, 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 what I'm going to describe. Um, so what I'm planning to do uh, is basically start by telling you a little bit of a, just a small story. Uh, that comes out of a dairy cooperative we work with in the Kiambu region uh, in Kenya. This is based on joint work with Lorenzo. Uh, 
And um, I think you'll see that the story I'm telling you from this cooperative is somewhat specific, but certainly not atypical. I'm sure that you have all very similar stories from cooperatives in other places, in other crops, and so forth. And what I want to do is to learn some, try to take away some lesson from this specific story, which can maybe be applied to understand across organization variations uh, in performance. All right? So uh, let's, let's get to the story. So basically, um, we, uh, Lorenzo and I, uh, um, and you know, in partnership with Greg, we, were, uh, we set up a partnership uh, to work in close collaboration with a large dairy cooperative in, uh, in central Kenya. And uh, when we first talked with the management of uh, this cooperative, um, the problem of low loyalty and systematic side selling of afternoon milk was presented to us as uh, one of the key uh, challenges. At some point uh, in February 2014, there was the General Assembly where uh, you know, uh, the members of the cooperative met. And again, the board very forcefully uh, restated the fact that there are a number of formal provisions um, uh, that discouraged or should, were meant to prevent site selling of milk. In particular, you know, the statute of the cooperative, the bylaws of the cooperative say that, you know, if you are a member, you have to sell all your milk to the cooperative, apart from some milk that you keep for private consumption. And if you don't do that, there will be financial penalties associated with it. Uh, the cooperative might refuse to buy your milk when you have excessive milk. And eventually, if you still do not comply, you might uh, face expulsion from the society, from the cooperative. So we were fortunate enough that to work in partnership with the cooperative so that we could analyze uh, the delivery of the farmers following this uh, general assembly in which the board restated, again, very, very loud and strong uh, these provisions. Okay? So basically, it's just at the meeting, the, member, the management of the cooperative say, hey, guys, we have a problem with loyalty. Remember, these are the penalties uh, that are associated with not complying. And what we see is basically is that, uh, you know, I'm going to plot, uh, uh, you know, essentially a daily average of daily derivative between deliveries to the cooperative between two different group of farmers. Um, the gray line is the farmers that were already delivering. So those were the loyal farmers before the uh, General Assembly. And the black line instead is the um, farmers that were not delivering. So those are the farmers that were in a way target uh, of the announcement at the and the first lesson that you, we see is that, you know, after the uh, assembly, uh, which is the red line, slowly, slowly, the delivery uh, from the farmers that were not being loyal before sort of improved over time. So the first lesson is that there seems to be a sense in which this announcement, this uh, restating what people were supposed to already know, uh, sort of increased delivery. At the same time, this average positive effect conceals a lot of heterogeneity. So some of the farmer, farmers that were not loyal before started the delivering or increased their deliveries back to the cooperative. But a large number of farmers as well exited, that is, completely left the cooperative. So we're interested also in, in pointing out the fact that, you know, restating these bylaws, um, you know, increase, if you like, loyalty, but uh, in a very heterogeneous, you know, but this average increase conceal a lot of heterogeneity. Not only that, the, the cooperative also sent out letters to the farmers, essentially with the same med message. And we see a little bit of a crowding out of uh, these two uh, things. So the, if you think that the members that attended the, the General Assembly are more, maybe more engaged, among those that were targeted and then also received the letter, the letter seems to have had a slight negative effect on their delivery. So it seems like maybe you, know, you have some kind of intrinsic motivation. This is what takes you. Uh, to the assembly in the first place, and then uh, you know if you really come off the management come off come out after you uh, in a very strong manner, also with the letter, you might alienate some of the members. Okay, so there was this uh, uh, kind of uh, initiative to uh, bring back loyalty, and uh, that initiative had some positive effect. There was a lot of heterogeneity. This is actually not the part of the. A story that I find more interesting. The part of the story that I find more interesting is that, of course, many farmers still didn't comply. And so it's not that loyalty was uh, completely sort of rebuilt after, after this. 
What did the cooperative do? Did the cooperative implement the punishment that they had threatened at the assembly and through the letter? Of course they didn't. So in other words, we have a case, and this is the part of the, of the, uh, of the story which I think is uh, common across many other organizations. There's a problem with, with loyalty. There's a letter, there's a comp, you know, cooperative bylaws. Those are disattended, and somehow it's just very hard to uh, enforce punishment and enforce the formal rules of the cooperative. So what we did with Lorenzo is that uh, we went to the non-complying farmers, that is those that uh, were still not, uh, had not, had still not improved their loyalty uh, after the General Assembly and the letter, and try to understand a little bit their views, and um, you know, try to try to gain some insight for why it might be difficult for the organization, for the cooperative, to essentially uh, enforce the bylaws. And what we see in this survey is that there is a lot of heterogeneity among these farmers on what they perceive to be legitimate policies that the cooperative could implement, uh, you know, in order to gain their loyalty back. And I think that with, with Lorenzo, we sort of walked away from that impression, like saying, look, um, this is certainly a well-intended organization, maybe the not, not the best functioning cooperative you will find uh, you know, in Kenya or in East Africa. I think the general message here is that this heterogeneity in the perception that the members have about what the cooperative is supposed to do is what creates the challenge in implementing or in sort of carrying forward, sort of implementing the, the, the policies. And so it almost makes me feel like saying that, you know, a well-functioning cooperative is a cooperative, or in general, a well-functioning organization, and cooperative being a special case, is one in which the management has succeeded in building relationship with the common understanding of what the organization is about. And um, so it's through this lens of sort of common understanding and building relationship that I want to think a little bit about across organizational uh, differences or differences across cooperatives in performance. So I see some questions uh, that are coming up on the board. Lorenzo will tell you more specifically about the context and the context in which the site selling and the low loyalty was taking place. I, I, for the purpose of my sort of presentation, I just kind of really want to reiterate this point that in a way what that story tells me is that, you know, uh, Management is essentially about building, sustaining, and nurturing relationship. In this case, nurturing relationship with the with the farmers, and that uh, an organization will be well functioning if somehow the management has managed to create a common understanding within the members of the organization about what is the mission, what are the rules of the organization, and somehow that specific cooperative we were working with, it seems that they had not succeed in creating this common understanding between their members. All right, so now, building on this, I'm going to uh, share a few uh, findings from a completely different setup. I'm going to go to Rwanda, and uh, I'm going to look at the coffee sector. And so this is, a jo uh, I'm going to tell you facts that are based on joint work that I've done with uh, Amit Morjari, another colleague who is at Northwestern University. And the reason why I want to go there is because in that work we have done in the coffee sector in, uh, in Rwanda, rather than just working with a very strong partnership with a particular cooperative, we were able to collect good data across many, many different organizations and many different cooperatives. And that allows us to look a little bit at the difference uh, The, uh, the lesson I take away from that simple story is, uh, is the idea that what we want to look for uh, to understand sort of what differentiate organizations that work well from those that do not work well is the underlying idea that a lot of what the management of the organization should be focusing on is uh, building, sustaining, and nurturing relationship with the members of the organization. In our case, since we are talking about cooperatives, this will be the farmers. And uh, creating a common understanding about what the organization is about. And somehow we felt that uh, in the specific uh, Kenyan context we were working in with Lorenzo, um, we, 
you know, we, we, we had some evidence that that particular organization had not succeeded in creating a common understanding about what was legitimate from the point of view of the organization in terms of policies to deter uh, non com site selling and to build a, a loyalty. And so now I'm going to go in a context which is going to be uh, the coffee sector in Rwanda, where we have surveyed about 200 organizations. And so I can compare across organizations uh, the characteristics or that uh, seem to correlate with good performance versus not good performance. So we have been uh, serving coffee mills and uh, or coffee washing stations. So these are essentially uh, firms, either private sector firms or cooperatives, that um, process coffee from the farmers, essentially wash and dry the coffee uh, that is produced by the farmers and then sell it to exporters and to other intermediaries. And uh, linking up with what Greg said, what we were kind of trying to measure in this environment is the extent to which these different mills or these different washing stations um, use services or provide services with the, to the farmers. In particular, whether they provide input before harvest, whether they buy on credit, whether they make second payment, whether they help farmers accessing uh, loans or possibly help farmers when farmers need help uh, even away from the harvest season. And uh, although the figures are uh, a little bit fuzzy, um, they measure this different um, dimension of services. And one thing that we see is that all the different type of services, the extent to which these different organizations provide services, is strongly positively correlated uh, with each other. So in other words, it's not that we see an organization that offers one service, an organization that offers another service. We tend to see instead that these good practices offering services come clustered one another. So there's something where there are organizations that are well functioning and all the services are provided, and other organizations that are not so well functioning and no services provided. And the extent to which these services are provided very strongly correlate with, one, the trust that the farmers report with respect to this uh, uh, organization they supply their, uh, uh, their coffee to, and two, the performance of the organization. Okay, so it seems that Organizations that do well are those that provide a lot of these services uh, and provide, you know, all these different services, not just some and not just others. So obviously we are in an environment in which it is costly to provide these services and, you know, is an environment where, you know, all of these services has to be provided through, um, you know, what I would say relationship, by which, by which I mean that, you, you know, if I give a credit to the farmer and then the farmer is not loyal, is I'm not going to take this farmer to a court. So the farmer must be willing uh, uh, to deliver the coffee and to repay the loan out of the value of the relationship that uh, uh, the farmer assigns to the organization. And so one implication of, uh, of such finding is that when we, you know, if the scope of an organization should be to sort of build, sustain and nurture relationship with farmers, Competition from other organizations can make that job harder. So when there is more competition, uh, and we have good variation across these organizations in the extent of competition that they face, we see that uh, the use of this relationship is significantly lower in places where there are more meals. And that also means that where there is more competition, trust will be lower, loyalty will be lower, and organizational performance will also be lower. Now, these graphs that I've put, and, you know, uh, are about average relationship um, in, an, in an industry uh, in which we have, uh, out of these 200 organizations, approximately half of them are cooperatives and half of them are private means. So I'm also interested in thinking a little bit about the comparison between private organizations and cooperative organizations. What I just told you, the need to build relationship, the fact that this relationship uh, take the form of services, the fact that these services are clustered with each other, and the fact that it is hard to build this relationship where there is more competition, this holds true, is true both for cooperatives and for private organizations. However, 
what I think is distinctive about cooperative is that cooperatives are, relative to private organization, much more fragile. They are more fragile institutions, which means that you know, they can bring more value, but they can also do worse. And so this last figure, what it plots, is some measure of performance, which is essentially the, um, a measure of unit processing cost. And I plot the distribution in red for the cooperatives and in blue for the, uh, um, for the private mills. And although the average performance is similar between private and uh, uh, cooperatives in this industry, the red line shows much more dispersion in performance among cooperatives than among private means. We see a bunch of cooperatives that really do very, very well, but we also see cooperatives that do fairly poorly. While we do not see private uh, firms uh, do either very, very well or do very, very poorly. So there is potentially more dispersion uh, among cooperatives than among private firms. And then this, I think, begs the question as to why that might be the case. I think the answer is that cooperatives relative to private firms are more fragile institutions. They are more fragile precisely from the point of view of building relationship with the farmers. Why are they more fragile? But potentially, which means that they, they can do worse, but potentially can also do better. Because the organization you know, can build a much deeper relationship with the farmer, then you know, the farmer feel much more engaged by the organization. That means that the, potentially the relationship that can be built have much more legitimacy along the lines of what sort of Greg was discussing. On the other hand, the management is possibly more opaque. There is a problem of the cooperative being a public good. So there is a problem of monitoring that public good. There is a problem of potentially run so that you know, if other farmers abandon the organization, my incentive to abandon the organization are stronger. And therefore, if the management fails to create the common understanding, then things can really go badly, potentially worse than uh, what would happen in, uh, in, in, you know, uh, for private company. All right, with this kind of general thought, uh, let me uh, hand over to, uh, to Lorenzo, who I think will uh, speak about uh, very specific elements or very specific services that can be provided to the farmers by these uh, cooperatives. So, Lorenzo, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks very much, Rocco. Hi again. Um, great. Uh, so, both, uh, both Greg and Rocco have proposed in different ways a comparative approach, which they, they uh, were providing evidence on different types of services. They were comparing different type of organizations. In this last presentation, we'll go very much in depth in one particular domain, uh, which is the provision of financial services that COPs, in which COP may play a big role. Before doing that, let me just say that working with Greg and working uh, 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 with the uh, partner cooperative staff and management has been a big privilege for us. We've learned a lot. And while you know, what I think we primarily brought is some methodological contribution, a lot of the results, a lot of the insights stem directly from the inputs that our partners have provided throughout the process. So there has been a, sort of a lot of work on the role of cooperatives in providing financial services when financial markets are imperfect, when access to banks is complicated, when access to insurance for rural farmers is, is hard to achieve. And most of this long-standing work has focused on two types of financial services, credit, getting loans in kind or, or in cash, uh, and risk protection, like price stabilization, so demand guarantee, and so on and so forth. In this research that we have conducted over the past two and a half, two years, um, we focus on a dimension of financial access that is somewhat less understood or less studied, which is access to savings. Okay. Um, over the last few years, there's been growing evidence that difficulties in savings are as important as difficulty in accessing credit to uh, uh, sort of generate investment growth and in turn development broadly, broadly defined. Um, the, in our in initial work, when we started working, one uh, uh, thing that came up a lot was that uh, one service or implicit service that farmers value concerned the frequency of the payments that the COP provides. This is a dairy cooperative, of course. 
And uh, um, this is a, um, in this type of arrangement, the farmers are paid on a monthly basis. So they sell milk to the, to the co-op every day, actually twice a day, in the morning and the afternoon. Uh, but the co-op, unlike other players, like these other traders that, we, that Greg was hinting at, is basically the only agent that pays on a monthly basis. Okay? So initially, you know, we weren't sure if this was a good or a bad thing from the, farm, from the perspective of the farmer. And then uh, from the very you know, initial focus groups that we run, consistent with some other previous work that was, that was done, we found overwhelming that uh, a lot of the farmers that sell to the co-op value the fact that the co-op can hold the money for the month and credit will pay at the, end of the, uh, you know, at the end of the 30 days. And why is this? Because these payments help to achieve what we call saving goals, which is the farmer needs to have a lump sum in their hands to make purchases, uh, for instance, uh, for the two things that come up a lot are daily fees uh, and, uh, and school fees. While being paid a small amount every day implies that there's a risk that this money will be wasted, that they will not be uh, uh, able to save it on, a, on this medium term. So crucially, the co-op has what we could say a competitive advantage in this, in this setting. For the most part, at least in the area we work in, farmers trust the cooperative more than traders, and in particular, they do not trust these itinerant traders to hold the money until the end of the month. They are worried that if they leave the money with the, with the traders, they will run away and never come back. And this relates to some of the points that Greg was mentioning about, uh, I, I don't have the strength to chase, to chase this farmer. And so the, the interesting insight that we hypothesize is that farmers achieve a, a financial portfolio by a portfolio of traders. And in particular, a lot of the farmers in this area sell both to the co-op, and in this way they achieve what we call saving, or they, they reach their saving goals, but they also obviously need liquidity to buy food every day, and this is what the trader's daily payment provides. So the insight here is that the output market, the buyer-seller relationship, provides an indirect way to achieve a, a balance in financial portfolios for this, for this, uh, uh, for this fund. So, the, as, as a second step after this initial focus groups, we ran a survey with about 600 farmers that sell both to the traders and to the cooperatives. And what we find, let me not go maybe in detail in each of these uh, uh, points, but that uh, a lot of farmers say about 80% you know, say that they have saving goals that they are trying to achieve. Again, the, the kind of thing I want you to think about is, for instance, buying a bag of feed that is worth you know, a couple of weeks of revenues from each cow. Um, and then they mention overwhelming that the COP helps in reaching these saving goals and that they will reach the goals less if the COP, for instance, were to pay weekly rather than every month. Okay, so the frequency or the, the low frequency of the COP payments is reported by the farmers to help them to achieve these saving goals. Um, so why they could be valuable, uh, these, these monthly payments? First, the sort of the underlying hypothesis that farmers have lumpy expenses, and so they will need to get a lump sum to, to make these expenses. The second is that uh, in, this, uh, in this form of delayed payment or in frequent payment, money is not accessible. So there is a growing evidence from behavioral literature that a whole set of agents, not just farmers, but uh, uh, small business owners, households, have a demand for commitment devices. They worry that uh, you know, if, they, if they have uh, money in their hands, they will waste it, or maybe my brother will come and will ask me for, to, you know, to spend the money on something else. And so they value the option to tie their hands, to, to uh, uh, diminish access on a daily basis until this target is, is reached. And uh, this commitment is something that banks are not necessarily in a good, in a good position to provide very often. Uh, we find in local financial institutions that do not provide financial products with these uh, commitment uh, uh, characteristics. And also, you know, in general, banks uh, have very high entry costs for small players. For instance, a lot of the saving accounts that are, that are available in the region have very high deposit requirements. They, don't, they may not be uh, uh, a good fit for, for small, medium farms. Okay, so, so the second step of our study was survey. And now I want to also discuss briefly uh, a contribution that I think uh, you know, is, is growing that we are very excited to bring to this specific setting, which is the use of actual experiments to test hypotheses. So there's been a growth in uh, randomized controlled trials to evaluate what can really work and what cannot work uh, in broadening in the, in the developing development aid context. Uh, so 
in theory, how would we want to test the hypothesis that value the farmer's value in frequent payments? We would want to change the payment frequencies uh, while keeping constant any other characteristic, right? I'm making, I'm hypothesizing that farmers value the COP in frequent payments, but there are other services that the cooperative may be providing. So I need to be able to disentangle the specific value that farmers attach to these monthly payments from these other benefits that the COP may be providing. And so in partnership with the management and the staff of the cooperative and Will and the Lakes, we design two experiments to exactly elicit this preference for infrequent payments. And so in the first experiment, 100 farmers in this, uh, uh, that sell to this cooperative were offered the opportunity to choose between uh, monthly payments and uh, daily payments. Okay, so at the beginning of the month, we say for the next month, which kind of payment do you want? Do you want to be paid every day or do you want to be paid at the end of the month? And also, for farmers that uh, choose to be paid uh, every single day, they get a 15% price increase in the price per liter of milk. Okay, so we made the option to take daily payments very appealing from a purely price perspective. And this goes back to Greg's initial point, which is, look, maybe prices are not the first order thing or not the only thing that farmers buy. So this is experiment one. And in experiment two, we, we design a slightly more sophisticated contract, which we call a flexibility option. So in the flexibility option that we offer to another sample of farmers, basically the farmers, in any single day, they can decide if they want to cash the amount for that specific day. And they can do as many times as they want. They can do that every single day, or they can do that one day, or they can do that never. Okay? So in this flexibility option, basically, the farmers, if they say, yes, for the next month, I want to have this flexibility option, they are not committing to anything. They are not saying, I want to be paid daily. They are just leaving the option open. Okay, so from a, you know, we, we, in economics, we say this is a dominating contract. You should basically always choose this contract unless what you are looking at is exactly, sorry, what you're looking for is exactly a commitment device. Right? By turning down this flexibility option, the farmers are saying, look, in the next month, I do not want to have the option to get payment on a daily basis because I value time in my hands. I value the fact that if my brother comes to me and say, hey, why don't you get the money today so that I can use it for something else? I can say, no, okay, I don't have that option. So there are two results that I want to emphasize. The first one is that in both experiments, the daily versus monthly and the flexibility versus monthly options, a lot of farmers, between 80 and 90%, say, I don't want to have these daily payments or I don't want to have this flexibility contract. Um, I prefer to have the monthly payments. And if there is one figure that I want you to remember, is that this bar shows that 84% of the targeted farmers say that they prefer to have the monthly payment as opposed to getting the daily payment with a 15% price increase. So they forego a substantial price increase to have the monthly payment, okay? Uh, and the second, we are sort of in a follow-up survey, we ask openly, why do you make this choice, okay? And what we find, obviously, I mean, this is answers that are coded exposed, but what we find is that about 45% of the farmers say that they have saving goals that they are trying to reach. And about 25 to 35% of the farmers say that they don't trust themselves in handling the cash. So if they had money on a daily basis, they would be worried that they will not get to these lump sums that are required to make these lumpy purchases for feed or for food. We also have some other interesting answers, which is in about 15% of cases, so small but non-trivial uh, uh, share. We, we interview the person that manages the daily business, which is in many cases the, the wife, and she says, look, I don't want the, monthly, the daily payment because the bank account where the money goes at the end of the month is my husband's, and so I cannot say to my husband, you are not going to get this, this money at the end of the month. Okay, so the, they read, the, the wife says, my husband wants the money on the bank account at the end of the month, so I can't take, I cannot take daily payment. Okay, so it's a different explanation. It's a bit outside of our main mechanism, but nevertheless, it's relevant for a 15% uh, uh, of the farmers. So 
these results, these experimental results, show consistent with the survey evidence that farmers have a strong preference for infrequent payments, and uh, uh, that this preference is on the top of benefits, other benefits that the COP may be providing. And indeed, um, uh, once we, in, in this survey, we also ask questions about traders, one thing that we find is that the majority of farmers say that they trust traders less than the COP, and that they will never uh, um, want the traders to pay on a lower frequency basis, like to pay monthly rather than daily, because they are worried that the traders would escape if they were holding money of the farmers for a, for a long period of time. So in general, farmers do not trust traders and do not want them to pay monthly. And this heterogeneity in credibility in trust generates a competitive advantage in the COP in this financial service provision. Uh, one figure I don't have here is also that we also interviewed some, mem some farmers that do not sell to the COP. And what we find is that uh, farmers that say that they sell to the COP are more likely to state that they are trying to save, and they are more likely to say that they reach their saving goals, consistent with the idea that the COP does play a role in this setting in achieving financial, financial goals. Now, the last figure that uh, uh, I want to mention before, before wrapping up goes back to this idea that uh, uh, a lot of farmers sell every single day, both to the COP and to the traders. In particular, a lot of farmers sell the morning milk to the COP and the afternoon milk to the traders. And uh, uh, why we hypothesize that one, maybe not the only, but one reason why this happens is that they are trying to achieve a balance between saving and liquidity by selling to, to buyers that pay a different frequency. And so what we did in the survey was uh, we asked uh, to, to this sample of farmers, how do they spend money that come from different sources? In particular, how do they, how they spend money from monthly payments versus money from daily payments that the traders make? And what we find, we go, without going too much in detail, is that uh, the share of money coming from traders that is spent on food consumption, this gray bar, is very high, right? This daily payment, we primarily use them for buying food on a daily basis or other goods that I need to buy at a high frequency, while a disproportionate share of money coming from the cooperatives, so these dark bars, are spent on dairy inputs, okay? and these dairy inputs have a lumpy component. I cannot buy a bit of feed every day because these are sold in big bags. Okay? And so this lumpiness of consumption of a consumption or investment is important to explain our proposed mechanism. Okay, so just to sum up, the traders fund daily consumption, while the COP primarily funds lumpy expenses, their inputs are also school fees. Okay, so with this, uh, uh, you know, focus on one specific uh, financial service, which I think was a, a, a sort of a nice contribution building on other type of financial services that had been studied before, so let me, let me wrap up and uh, propose five takeaway lessons and then open the floor to, to Q&A. So one message I want to give is that these are markets where there are a lot of imperfections. There are imperfections in financial markets, there are imperfections in output markets, access to services is complex. And so while obviously prices are an important determinant of competitiveness, they are not necessarily the primary driver of loyalty in this setting. Other type of services, like this financial service I discussed, may matter a lot. Um, the, COP, the COPs provide a range of different services, and understanding which ones are more, are, you know, more salient to the farmers, which ones are understood as being more important, is, uh, is an important question that any organization and researchers have to, have to uh, uh, figure out. Uh, building trust is an important driver of, uh, uh, of loyalty. And it's not an easy thing to achieve. Okay, we've seen that in this setting, uh, the COP can compete because farmers trust that they will make payments at the end of the month as opposed to running away. But for other types of services, you may require different types of trust that are not necessarily easily, easily built. And uh, in our specific research, what we find out is that loyalty, and by this we mean 
how much milk I sell to the co-op and how many members sell to the co-op is influenced by specific financial needs that the co-op have, and in particular, this uh, very stark uh, coexistence in which many farmers sell both to the co-op and to the traders is influenced by the fact that these farmers have uh, a need both for a frequent cash flow and of achieving saving needs in the medium term. And then finally, the, and this goes back a bit to, to Rocco's ending point, uh, we see a, a wide heterogeneity in COP performance. And so understanding what drives this heterogeneity that may be larger than what we see in private companies is important. Here we have talked about loyalty, competition, and managerial ability as important drivers of this dispersion in, in COP performance, but this is just a first step. There is much more to learn. So with this, uh, let, me, let me conclude. Thank you again. So we're now uh, open for, for questions and answers. So the daily payments are mostly done in cash or through mobile money, like oh, M-Pesa. Yeah. Yeah. Does it make a difference uh, in terms of their So definitely the fact that the COP makes a direct deposit into the bank helps. Um, so that's one element of the frequency of payments that matter. But to some extent, the second experiment also shows that the fact that the money is withheld, so the commitment component also plays a role. So it's not just the transaction cost side but also this commitment component. So it, it, it does influence the preference if, mm -hmm. if it's a daily payment because the money isn't available paid, but it, there's still a strong preference for the free Exactly, exactly. Thank you. This is a question um, that came up during Rocco's presentation. So um, perhaps Rocco will want to chime in, but you can chime in as well. Kind of a, a stark question about um, private service providers. If cooperatives are struggling, why not simply put the emphasis on private service providers? If a cooperative collapses, won't the private service providers take over? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's, uh, that's perfectly fine. And in fact, uh, in the specific uh, sector from which the figure were coming, uh, so the Rwanda coffee, it is indeed the case that uh, a lot of the struggling uh, cooperative have been, the, the meals owned by a lot of the struggling cooperatives have been kind of rented out uh, by private sector providers. Uh, so it's totally fine. The I guess the market, in a way, sort of, you know, allow, and the heterogeneity figure show that, that there are, there are also some COP that do well, and that there are some COP that do not do, uh, do not do very well. And then the question is, you know, one way to improve the working of a COP is indeed for private guys to, to come in, and, uh, you know, if, you are, if they are better managers. Another way is to try to improve the, um, the performance of the COP. In some of these agricultural chain, I mean, again, it depends on context. I think that the concern is that the cooperative might be, all else equal, in a better position to uh, maximize the welfare of the farmers. Because a monopolistic downstream processor, instead, they might you know, have slightly different incentives. So there might be an argument for why well-functioning cops uh, might be preferred. But hey, if, you know, if the cop is not functioning well, it's totally fine for uh, private guys to step in. I think. I mean, at least that's my 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 view. There are there are I think bad reasons why sometimes cooperatives are kind of helped or subsidized, and that's because they give a lot of political control to the. And you know, these I think are not the good reasons to help the the cops. Uh, but there might be very good reasons to help cops, and some which I've mentioned before. I don't know whether that answers your, your question. No, I mean, I guess the thing I would add to what Rocco had said, and I think what came out from his his research is, you know, the the fact that in, in this particular industry there there's a mix, 
So it's a combination, and we talked about the nature of competition, even looking at the dairy industry. I mean, farmers have options in these cases, and so um, they're making different choices, and that's okay. Farmers have a choice. Some are belonging to cooperatives. They see value of doing that. Some are, are selling to private dairy. Some are selling directly to traders. Um, so we're seeing very, you know, various different models working and being applied. Um, but what we're trying to show is that you know, there's some reasons possibly behind what's driving this. And so understanding that, how does that, under, how does that help us in working with these types of organizations and in working with farmers and farmers groups? Yes, and, and just sorry, just Greg, just to reiterate, just to remake the point that, yeah, I'm, you know, the in a way what that particular context Rwanda showed was that the best performing cooperatives perform better than the best performing private um, firms. So a well-run cooperative might be at an advantage, maybe precisely because it establishes a stronger partnership with the with the farmer. As the woman said in the quote, uh, making sure that there is a future market for the product is important as well. Did your study look at those types of things? Uh, Go ahead. Not, not explicitly in, uh, in these studies that uh, were presented, but obviously we completely agree that uh, uh, historically the, the marketing role of the COP has been, and today is, is still very important. Though I think that in understanding the relevance of, uh, at least for the Kenya dairy sector, one also has to take into account that uh, the sector is probably more competitive than it used to be. And so maybe this marketing role does not necessarily play uh, uh, such a strong role as, as 10 or 15 years ago. But, but it's not something that we address directly yeah. in the... In the we didn't direct, uh, directly ask the question either, but I think it's an interesting nuance to the access to market piece. And um, you know, some reasons behind that. I think in Trivoli, that I think anecdotally, that's what we're seeing. Um, and maybe there's an opportunity to, to dive into that a little bit more. So very good point. Thank you. Um, all right, we have another question from online. Uh, but first, I thought I would just mention that we do have over 70 attendees joining us uh, via webinar. So that's fantastic. From places as far as Bolivia, the UK, Peru, Liberia, and Kenya, and as close as here in DC in the building and, uh, and Baltimore nearby. So I um, wanted to, to let you all know that we do have a, a strong online audience. And this is a question from, rolling up here, a question from Stephen Mink, who says, in numerous countries, such as Indonesia, Vietnam, and Cambodia, True farm member-driven co-ops are struggling to emerge from long periods of political meddling by political processes. And trust has to do with overcoming the resulting memories of, of farmers that political forces have distorted many decisions in the cooperatives. Your research base does not really speak to this context, but do you have any observations on countries that have done a better job of transitioning uh, from periods of such political interference in cooperative governments to a healthier member accountable cooperative leadership. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a question that we could spend a whole separate ag sector council on. Um, so th thanks for raising it. Uh, I'll just speak from our experience working with in the dairy sector in Kenya, for example. And I think one of the interesting uh, things about the cooperatives we've been working with is that they've been around for a very long time. So I talked about the average tenure of membership, that these cooperatives have gone through a number of different iterations over decades of time. And so one of the important things that uh, we've worked with them on is, is recognizing how to overcome these challenges. Because these challenges of political interference are not unique to the developing world. We've gone through them on our own soil. Um, as, as cooperatives have evolved. And so uh, the confidence to be able to directly address those, to be able to advocate, is, um, is really crucial. And in, in many cases, they've, they've done this. I think I pulled up a quote from one of the uh, co-op farmers in the focus group talking about how they actually exited the cooperative because of uh, some of the governance and leadership challenges and then yet remained and came back. And so there's examples of where uh, a dedicated membership, one that has some governance structure, can help overcome some of the, the different challenges they face. 
Um, so one, uh, this is not something that we have addressed directly in the research, but I think that uh, in terms of future uh, uh, research endeavors, it would be very important uh, um, to map and to collect data on political uh, power turnover within the COP. To which extent do we see management changing? To which extent do we see board members changing? Uh, do members expect uh, that uh, them or somebody else in their family could take a lead role in the COPs in a few years? Uh, we did a bit of uh, uh, this preliminary data collection in our survey, though it, it wasn't the focus. But I think that especially as one moves toward a more comparative approach where uh, many data from many different organizations are collected, uh, these are data that, that should be prioritized to quantify this, this phenomenon. And maybe Rocco has done more in this realm of stuff. I don't know. If, I, I'll just uh, chip in a couple of thoughts on Stefan's question. First of all, I agree. This is a, this is a key question, and I think it's a very important one. And uh, there is some work uh, uh, in the context of, uh, done in the context of Indian uh, sugar cooperatives that suggest that um, inequality in land holdings seems to correlate with, uh, among farmers, seems to correlate with poorer um, performance of, uh, of the cooperative. And uh, this is basically because, uh, you know, if you have a cooperative that is dominated by a few large uh, farmers, uh, those guys will have, might end up having uh, uh, an easier time, essentially, in diverting resources away from the cooperatives towards their uh, private benefit. And, you know, this can happen paradoxically uh, through the provision of services that uh, benefit disproportionately larger farmers, okay? So this, I think, puts a, um, and, you know, to the extent that sort of some of historical legacy maps into this inequality, I think that that could be a determinant. But then again, I think the, the, the context of Rwanda is a, is a promising one uh, to look at because I mentioned that we see a big variation across cooperatives in, uh, in their performance. And obviously, the recent history uh, of, uh, of Rwanda uh, is, a, is a, you know, it, 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 it has been tarred by, by very negative events that have potentially had very negative con consequences on uh, the general level of trust and the level of trust on, um, in, in, in those that hold power at the local level. And yet we see that in that environment, uh, some cooperatives are really thriving and doing very well. Now, m maybe this is just a, you know, in the micro, an illustration of the, you know, kind of the broader transformation that is happening in that country. But it does also suggest that there might be scope for overcoming uh, very negative legacies. But I wouldn't know how that can be achieved or, you know, who has achieved it and how, how the people that has achieved it are different from those who didn't. So I think it's a great question. Great, thank you. And we have another in-room question. Is there any correlation between the size of the farmers uh, in terms of uh, the amount of the milk delivery delivered? and uh, who sell their milk to the um, cooperative and to the farmers or the traders. There is any correlation between that? Yeah. So uh, that's something we look at. Uh, in one of the surveys, we collected a random sample of farmers, regardless of you know, who they were selling to. And from that, we see that in, in our setting in Kiambu in, in central Kenya, uh, farmers uh, that are selling to the cop are slightly larger. These are all very small farmers, so the number of cows is between one and three. And I think farmers selling to the cop are something like uh, 2.7 versus 2.3 uh, um, cows, so small but significant difference. Now, we don't have evidence for that, but that's consistent with the fact that uh, if the cop's uh, payments help to save, you will build up your, your stock of cows. Obviously, I don't have any uh, you know, direct evidence to validate by some hypothesis. All right, this is a question um, from Yenisa Tedese Gebrselev. Uh, quite a mouthful, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, who asks for some concrete suggestions on how cooperative management members and build strong relationships with cooperatives in addition to creating common understanding of the purpose of the cooperative? Is that, is that a broad question or is that one that you can address? 
No, I, I think it's an important one, and uh, I think it falls under, in my view, it falls under the the trust equation. And so, you know, there, that's multidimensional, but as I think about it, you know, it's two ways. So one is uh, cooperatives creating a, a mechanism to listen and to hear member grievances. And so what we've seen is that that's easy when you're a smaller organization. Maybe you're a co-op with 50 people. If you're, if you're the manager or the lead of that cooperative, it's easy for you to hear those voices. When you become large, integrated thousands of members, it becomes tough. I've seen situations in other countries where there's a line of 100 farmers waiting to talk to the chairman uh, of, of, the, of the cooperative, of the board. right? And, and so figuring out a management structure to deal with those grievances and, and also listen is, is critically important. And then likewise, the flip side of that is communicating out um, the purpose and, and, and vision of the, of the cooperative and having common agreement and alignment. And we saw examples, in, in perhaps Lorenzo and Rocco can comment more on this experiment about the bylaw changes and how that was disseminated to the, to the cooperative in two different ways. And so they did some interesting research comparing, uh, comparing those two ways. So it's two, you know, I see it both as a listening mechanism and also as getting uh, information out to the membership. Great, are there additional questions from in-room participants? I have a very broad, big picture question. Um, it doesn't directly correlate to your research, but I'm just curious. Um, a lot of us on the implementation side are tasked with um, very concrete indicators on capacity building of um, farmer-based organizations and co-ops. How, how can we uh, pitch or convince donors that it's important to also measure feelings of trust and loyalty and um, how that can be an indicator of success. Do you want to answer it? <laughs> I wish I could. Uh, what, you, what you focused on is critically important. And it's something that uh, I wish we could convince uh, those responsible to look at the types of indicators that uh, are correlated with the long-term success rather than the short-term performance of these types of institutions. Uh, we are, we, our office separately is working with a program uh, called Local Works, and we are going to be proposing uh, indicators, or using indicators actually, that are quite different than the norm. We'll be looking at uh, the uh, something very similar to, to this research, we'll be looking at uh, the net promoter score of, the, uh, of, uh, of organizations that serve constituents. We'll be looking at uh, the, any movement in the hubs of, uh, of networks from external to internal resources. And we'll be looking at uh, changes in social capital uh, indices over time. Uh, but we have the luxury of about a 10-year program, so it's, uh, it's something that uh, these types of measures can be defended. Uh, but I, I think really the, uh, the responsibility for this type of change rests in the people in this room and the people on the, on the webinar. And that is trying to explain to and convince decision makers within this agency and the broader development community that there are measures that are far more significant than the ones we use and ones that uh, basically do correlate strongly with the long-term success of these types of institutions. If I can, can add briefly, uh, I also think that uh, what I mentioned on this, uh, it's always perceived that collecting information indicators like trust, relationship, and social capital, it's going to be costly or too hard, uh, while I think that you know, social scientists uh, have developed and test uh, by now modules that are pretty standard, decently easy to implement. Uh, to obviously, you know, it's not a perfect measurement, but it's a starting point. We've seen some examples in the work today, so it's, you shouldn't think of collecting trust as something that is going to take one day per farmer. Right? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, all right, just a couple of quick clarifying questions. Um, 
about the, the research in Kenya. Um, one was, what criteria did you use to choose the farmers for the study? And also a clarification about what percentage of the beneficiary pool were members versus non-members in the dairy cooperatives in Kenya. Uh, so there were multiple studies discussed uh, throughout the presentation. So the first one was the expect with the, um, the letter, the, the, the impact of the restating of the bylaws on the levies, the one that Rocco talked about, and there we used the entire population to uh, see how targeted member responded after the, the meeting versus uh, non-targeted member that were members that were already selling all of their milk. Uh, then for our studies, we had a random sample. We had basically random samples, and depending on the specific component, it was a random sample of all the members for the experiment, random sample of the members selling both to the cop and to the traders for some of the survey questions, and then um, for uh, the brief survey in which we compared members and non-members, it was just a random sample of the farmers in the area. Okay? And then there's some technicalities in some attrition for some of the studies, but uh, the details are in the papers that I think are uh, uh, linked in. Thank you. Answering those clarifying questions and for the oh. big picture questions that were asked, um, given time, we'll go ahead and wrap up with some final words from Tom. Well, since we're toward the end of the session, I won't wrap up with many words. Only to uh, first thank the, uh, the presenters. Uh, I've worked with co-ops since 1975, and I learned quite a bit today, and I, I, I thank them for that. And I think uh, this it highlights, I think, this type of presentation, the importance of not uh, acting in terms of what we think is the case, but actually using research to inform what we do. And I, I personally would like to express my appreciation to uh, to Greg, Lorenzo, and Rocco for, for a really fine uh, piece of research and for sharing it with us. I'd like to also thank those of you who uh, came this morning, as well as the 70 odd, uh, I hope they're not really odd, but the 70, 70 participants on the, on the webinar. Uh, for taking their time and sharing their questions. I would ask the webinar uh, participants to uh, uh, complete the uh, poll that you find on your screen, and uh, that will help to ensure that these types of programs continue and improve. Uh, all the post-event products will be posted on AgriLinks, and everybody will receive a post-event email with those links. Uh, we hope that you will uh, uh, use AgriLinks frequently and, con and contribute and benefit from it. I'd like to again thank the, uh, uh, the participants, the speakers, and particularly the Bureau for Food Security and AgriLinks for making this.